Hello, I'm Mally Shansfeld, Editor-in-Chief of Orthodontic Practice U.S., a Medmark publication. Welcome to a live discussion and question and answer with Dr. Lisa Alvitro. In our webinar today, we'll be exploring options for aesthetic class two correction utilizing the forces of lions. Before we get started, I would like to invite our viewers to use the question box in your control panel to ask any questions. Your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Now I'm pleased to introduce our guest for today, Dr. Lisa Alvitro. Dr. Alvitro is owner of Alvitro Orthodontics in Ohio and is an associate clinical professor at Case Western Reserve University. She continues to study and train her staff to stay current in the latest developments in the field of orthodontics. Her dedication to her profession has led Dr. Alvitro to become an advocate for 3M Oral Care, for whom she lectures extensively throughout the United States and abroad, sharing her experience and expertise. Dr. Alvitro, we turn the webinar over to you to learn more about our topic for today. Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon and thank you for joining me as we explore the options for aesthetic class 2 correction utilizing forces class 2 correctors. What I'd like to share with you is how you can expand your options for class 2 correction. Forces is something that we've been using in our office since it was introduced to the market. And I can honestly say that it's one of our favorite things to share because it's made such a significant contribution uh, to our patients, to our practice, and really the results that we can achieve for patients. And, and it's an appliance that is constantly um, evolving and there's changes and modifications and we really want to help everyone stay current with what options are out there. So forces connector or correctors today exist as the L-pin, the easy to, and now there's a wire mount option as well. I'd also like to share with you how to activate a 22 millimeter push rod. And I want you to consider the amount of class two correction that you can achieve. And because we're really amazed at what we're able to do, maybe things that we didn't think we were able to do five, 10 years ago. And I also want to encourage everyone to think about how to create the optimal force vector for effective class two correction because Class two, uh, class two correction in, in patients is different uh, based on what type of class two malocclusion they have. So what are the basic components of a forces? You know, obviously we have our arch wires, uh, we're going to have our headgear tube if we're going to be using an L-pin or an easy two module. Now we have the forces wire mount that we don't need a headgear to, but we can use a bonded molar or perhaps maybe it was a patient we weren't going to use a forces in and they have a band but there's no headgear to. We have our push rods which are going to activate our forces appliance for us. And there's the universal split crimp. That's what a lot of us were used to using when we were activating um, our appliance when it was in place. But now there's a reactivation spacer and you'll notice it has a little different shape. It's a complete circle and it's really effective in, in activating a 22 millimeter rod. So let's look at some of those spring options because here's when you're starting to create really your force system. You've got the easy two and an occlusal tube. You've got an occlusal headgear tube with an L-pin. You've got now a wire mount, um, so you don't even need a band, just a really uh, a reliable bond. And then we can also use an L-pin and a gingival tube. And I really just like to start here and everyone to kind of look at the difference. You know, your uh, wire mount can give you a more vertical force vector if you need it. Your easy module can be more horizontal. So think about not only the um, the activation of the appliance, but really the direction. Uh, do you need it horizontal? Do you need it more vertical? And we'll talk about you know, what different applications for those appliances. Now, the other thing that you need to consider too is what kind of bracket system can I use uh, forces with? So we've got really kind of a, a moderate class two relationship here. We've got a teenager. Um, you know, she wants straight teeth and a bigger smile. She wants to get rid of her, um, her overbite. You know, she wants her teeth to touch, and she doesn't want braces that show. And really, great option for those types of patients are Clarity Advance. And sometimes people ask, can I use a Forces with Clarity Advance? Yes, absolutely, you can. So our treatment option for her will be our Clarity Advance brackets and the maxillary and the mandibular arch, and we're going to combine it with Forces Class II correctors. So we've got a bilateral Class II relationship. 
We've got a transverse deficiency in the maxilla and the mandible. Remember, she wanted a bigger smile, and if you really look at the angulation of the buccal segments, we need to upright those segments, and we also need to make sure that our maxillary arch has the appropriate transverse dimension when we're going into our class two correction. So we're going to eliminate the crowding and rotations, and don't wait for a delayed eruption of second bicuspids. We don't need all of the teeth really present to go into our forces. Now, if we take a look at you know, the cephalometrics here, we know we've got an overjet, and we really want to try to control the position of the maxillary incisors and really correct our class two uh, relationship by bringing the mandibular arch forward. So this is really the treatment effect that we're looking for. Now, the one important thing you're going to need to do to set up a forces case is you need to establish maxillary incisor torque and then you also want to establish the maxillary incisor position. So here we are getting ready to go into our forces appliance. We have got our clarity advanced brackets, we've got our mandibular arch prepared, and we just really have the coil there to add some rigidity to where the um, bicuspids are still erupting. The important part is that you establish the ideal overjet that you need to be able to make that AP correction when your forces is in place. I mentioned we're going to use that closed coil just to add some rigidity to the upper arch wire. We're also going to cinch the maxillary arch wire to, um, to limit the amount of uh, molar distillation, and then we're going to want to cinch our lower arch. When we take a look at our forces in place, you'll notice that it's in your mouth right now and you can't see it, so it's really a nice combination. If someone doesn't want to see brackets, um, they're not going to want to see elastics or any type of class 2 correction appliance. I will have to admit, though, she does have blue ties and pink ties on, so sometimes they want their braces to show, and sometimes for special events they don't. Now, if we take a look at the correction we're able to achieve, here we are with our 22-millimeter rod. We then went ahead and advanced and placed a 25-millimeter rod and then went and allow that to continue until we're almost to an end-to-end -end position there. This is usually the, the type of correction we're looking for because we know when we remove that rod, there's going to be some rebound of those lower incisors. We found about two or three degrees. You know, part of the reason I let it in there is notice we had a space right dist or mesial to that cuspid. So we're going to go ahead and chain that lower arch and allow that rod to help push that space closed for us. Now this was a situation that we had a 22 millimeter rod and had to activate to a 25 millimeter rod, but that's not an issue anymore because now we have the ability to activate a 22 millimeter rod. You know, often if you were trying to use a, a universal split crimp, you'd place it on the 22 and it would want to slide down and you'd have to stack multiple ones up. Now we simply can activate a 22 millimeter rod by using that reactivation spacer and it will stop for us. The only difference you need to think about when you're going to be using a reactivation spacer instead of a split crimp is you have to take the, uh, the rod out from the spring module. Then I like to grab these with just a ligature cutter and then position it over top of the rod. And it's a very snug fit. So you really need to, to line those two components up and then you'll be able to just simply slide it down and it will stop for you. You can see here it is in place. So that's really eliminated us having to be able to, uh, or having to change to a 25 millimeter rod like you saw previously. And also, I need to tell you that those can be used on other types, um, you know, your 25s and beyond too. So really that, that uh, reactivation spacer can be used with any rod, just not the 22. So we're looking at that typical over, uh, that correction where we're going to go end to end and then at the next appointment, you know, here we are looking after we remove the rod. So from here to here, we simply remove the rod. We chain that lowers to help with that rebound, um, secured the upper, and then allowed everything to settle. And you know, usually what we're going to do is take out that rigid lower arch wire and put a nickel titanium wire in to let the bite start to settle. And there we are at our finished case. We're able to see our pre-treatment and post-treatment film. And then 
our end result from a facial uh, facial aesthetics with an increased uh, smile. We have a nice mandibular projection. We've got uh, lip support. So don't forget, you know, if, if someone's not wanting to, to see see their braces, uh, a lot of times forces is really a, a perfect option because you're not going to see that either. What about the wire mount option? Now this is something that's exciting and new because sometimes maybe you don't like to band, um, maybe you hadn't even planned on using forces. So let's take a look at what that wire mounted option looks like. Again, you can be used with maxillary molars that are bonded. Um, it eliminates the need for bands. Let me show you a little bit about the technique. You're going to set your lower arch up like you usually do with a forces appliance. We're going to cinch that lower arch. Now the max of the arch wire needs to be rigid because remember the wire mounted the wire mount is on the arch wire itself. So we're going to want a 19 by 25 and an 022. We're going to want a, an 0175 by uh, 025 in our 18 slot brackets. The one thing that we recommend when you have pins, the pins are slightly long. Because remember, they were made to go through that headgear tube. So we're going to reduce the length of those. We're then going to slide the wire mount module onto our arch wire. Now remember, they do come in two different sizes. There's an 022 uh, and an 018. And they go on either side. You just need to make sure uh, when you do slide it on that the, um, the headgear or the tube is toward the outside, that it's not uh, in between the brackets. Now, if you have a convertible uh, molar bracket, please make sure you tie that with steel because as that um, forces functions, it's going to place a, a buckle force. And if that is a convertible bracket, it could auto-convert for you. Sometimes people are unsure if their bracket is convertible or not. I always say if it has tie wings, just tie it in. Chances are it was made to be converted at some point. We also recommend steel tying the tooth anterior uh, to the wire mount as well because remember there's going to be some force on that arch and we don't want it to, um, to pop out of the slot. You know, A simple elastic tie can, can give some play in that as well. So just steel tie it and then as usual steel tie the bottom wherever the rod's going to be placed. Once you have the arch wire in place we recommend that you use a ligature tie to go around the the, um, the hook on the on the molar and then also around the T-bar that's on the on the wire mount. It's going to save it from sliding back and forth, but it also helps stabilize it when you're trying to um, try and, to install the appliance. Now here's a part that sometimes is confusing because if you take your ruler that you have from your old forces kits, if it's an easy module or L pin, what you're seeing on that ruler is actually uh, a picture of the of the bracket. You need to line that up with the wire mount, not the bracket. If you line it up with the bracket, you're going to end up overactive. So put the distal behind the wire mount and then measure and then you'll end up with the right size. And remember, the number that appears on the ruler actually includes the activation. Do not add to that. So we're going to insert the pin through the distal, and it's much easier if you've cut those pins smaller. Um, we're then going to just turn that up, and I like to use a jar back, and I'll turn it into a circle. So now that's really our completed um, installation. We'll slide the rod in and, and cinch it. Now you're going to have to consider your rod location because remember you are mounted anterior to the molar and that's different than when you're using a headgear tube. This now makes it's a shorter distance between the mesial of the molar and either the cuspid or the bi. So you're going to have to look at where do you want that to be located. You know a lot of us that use forces behind the bicuspid do that to help control the lower incisors but you can use it to the cuspid with your wire mount and you're still, you still have a short distance so you don't tend to see as much of that you know, rolling um, that we would see when we were using a longer rod. But sometimes people forget that it can affect um, not only the activation but how vertical that is placed. So let's just take a look at um, the case where we've got a wire mounted uh, forces in place. 
And again, this is going to be a nice case. We're going to need some vertical control. We've got a class two relationship. We've got um, an overbite, an, an open bite tendency. We want to increase really incisor display for him uh, and create a better smile line. At the same time, we're going to um, utilize our, our wire mounted forces. And you know, a lot of our patients in this age group are kids that. I want to have control of the case because I'm pretty sure I can't trust them to, uh, to be compliant with other types of appliances. So we just have a mild class 2 relationship, but we do have that vertical growth pattern. Here we are with our forces in place. You can see we started at the cuspid, then as we advanced forward, we moved it back to the bicuspid. You can see the yellow tie that was holding that module and securing it. We also have the upper arch chain to help reduce the amount of molar distillation and that lower arch is cinched. So you know, evaluate. You may start at the at the at the cuspid and move to the bi. And and this is a part I think where people tend to overlook with forces. We really tend to focus on the right activation, but we forget wherever we put the rod dictates how much of that force is dissipated in a horizontal direction and how much of it is dissipated in a vertical direction. So just really with an easy, with the wire mount, you have to remember you are anterior to that molar. Um, so you're, you, you may have a more vertical. Now if someone has an open bite tendency um, and a vertical growth pattern, this may be exactly what you want. But if they're deep and have um, more decrease lower face height, you maybe want to start at that cuspid or keep it there. You want to watch over activation too. Remember if you have a patient bite down and you see the rod coming out the back, you are overactivate. You're overactivating the appliance. And you know overactivation can lead to those lower incisor proclination or overactivation can roll your molars out. So the activation is just as com is as important than the uh, direction of the force as well. Now what if you're, you you like the angle but you think maybe I'm just a little bit overactive? The thing that's really convenient with a wire mount is since you have that pin, you can pull the pin out and kind of almost create like a half size. And you're re it's um, not as active than if you would pull that tighter, you'd be compressing that more. And the nice thing about it is there is a, a, a molar bond right there. So that's a, the patient's not really going to know that's there. You know, when you try to do this trick when you're hanging off of a headgear tube, it, it's out the back. It's, it can be in their cheek. This way it lays really close to that bracket so they're not going to feel that. And you can see that's one of the things that we were doing with this patient here too is I wanted um, that vertical nature but we were going to be a little bit overactive so I just pulled that pin out the back a little bit to give, the, um, give a little bit more play and, and uh, avoid overactivation. Oh, let me show you too. The other thing that you could do with that, if you needed to change the angle, remember you're allowed to bend that up or you can bend that down to change that angulation. And with there being a bracket right there, it's more stable than when you try to do it with just a headgear tube off of a band. So here we are, we removed our forces. And then we'll go into our, our finished case. What about a wire mounted forces uh, for patients who are not initially uh, planned for forces correction? You know, kind of a, a mild malocclusion. We're going to create space for the arch. And you know, looking at the beginning, we do have a midline deviation, and it's coming from the mandibular arch. You know, our maxillary midline is pretty much on, and you align the dentition. You're getting close. All you need is to correct the midline, and you just can't get there. Uh, sometimes midlines are hard, I think, with elastics, and sometimes it's hard to motivate patients. So, you know, before I would try to really motivate the patient because I didn't want to have to pull off a band that didn't have a headgear to put a new band on, maybe go back an arch wire size. So, we would try all kind of things, you know, try to motivate them, bribe them. Now with a wire mount, if someone doesn't wear their, if someone doesn't wear their elastics, the first time. 
we can put a wire mount on because we're not wasting any time, we're not losing any time. I'm just say we'll go ahead and, and do it right at that appointment because for some reason I thought that if someone doesn't wear them the first time, if I ask them, they'll wear it the second or third or fourth or fifth time. No, if they're going to do it the first time, great. If they're not, just put a wire mount on, keep going, and you're not having to waste any any time. And really, everything that we talked about applies. Just you're just running it off of um, you're still off the arch wire. You just happen to have a band behind there instead of a bond. And what's interesting, if you look at the midline correction, it's not a big midline correction that we need, but if, if you're not going to get there, you're really kind of stuck. And we put her uh, wire-mounted forces on here. She came back in one appointment, and we've got it. So, you know, don't forget about this option. This is something that, that has been really valuable for us. Let's talk about the consideration. You know, how much can you class two correction can you achieve? I'm just going to look at a patient that came back and is part of our retention study, and this obviously is our pre-treatment uh, facial pictures, and then we've got our pre-treatment malocclusion. So you know, he's got a significant malocclusion. He's deep. He's uh, also quite mandibular retronathic and sometimes people say what would you use on that can you use the forces yeah we did and I'll show you what um, how we did that but the, the thing I need to keep in mind sometimes people will think well if I've got a further distance to go I need to activate my appliance more no what you need to think of is set up the force system you want if is it horizontal is it vertical use the ideal activation secure your arch wires just keep it in longer. For some reason, people think, well, you only get to wear forces for six months. If I have further to go, I need to overactivate it. And what's going to happen if you overactivate? Your lower incisors will start to dump, your maxillary molars will roll, and your upper incisors will start to retrocline and you'll lose torque. So if we take a look at where we're able to achieve, and now this young man's in part of our retention study, you were able to see I mean, we could make some significant uh, facial changes. And um, now, if we go ahead and look forward to our malocclusion, over time he's starting to deepen up just a little bit. But if we compare, you know, let's look at those films. You know, that's a significant A, B, uh, a and B difference. Uh, we really want to increase mandibular projection. But look, he wore his forces for 12 months, and. Uh, that was something for me too. I always thought if I have to go further, I have to activate more. No, I just have to be patient. I just have to wear the appliance longer so that I can achieve the result that I want. So keep that in mind when you're when you're treatment planning something that's a little bit more complex or maybe a little bit more class two that yes, you can get uh, significant results with forces, but you may have to leave that in longer. So let's take a look about some of the things I think about when I'm treatment planning a more significant class two relationship. You know, we need to think about um, you know the AP difference we want to to correct. We also need to take a look at the transverse dimension. That's something that sometimes is very is overlooked. And if you don't have the correct transverse dimension, when you place forces, it's not going to lay at the right angle. And again, too, that's where sometimes people see, un or myself too, I'll see unusual effects in the maxilla. And it's because I didn't have the maxillary arch width set up. So that take a patient that's class two, position them into class one, and see, do I have enough transverse dimension? If I don't, I need to establish that before you try a class two correction so that you can get the optimal results. So we'll correct that transverse, and often for us it's including an RPE, so we'll use a rapid expansion appliance, run off the first molars as we have our um, fixed appliances in place. Obviously we want to align the dentition, I want to eliminate the overjet and the overbite. Uh, our other treatment object, we want to correct that anterior posterior discrepancy, increase mandibular projection, and then improve facial aesthetics. And we look at our pre forces setup. So we've got a significant overjet, but let's think about what's going to make this successful. 
first that maxillary mandibular arch preparation, having that maxillary transverse dimension, uh, making sure that that lower arch is prepared and that lower arch is secured by cinching it, uh, tying it back, however you like to do that. And you don't have to worry so much about bite opening. If you take a look, you'll see he's, he's still pretty deep but the rod alone is going to help intrude those lower incisors, about two and a half millimeters. If you need more than that, go ahead and sweep some bite opening curve into that lower arch when you are um, placing your forces. Now controlling the mandibular incisors is gonna be very important too for success because we wanna maintain them in, a, in an upright position. Best way to control lower incisors cinch the lower arch, put some negative torque in your wire or in the brackets, and um, don't overactivate. And that, I, I know I sound like I keep talking about that, but I used to overactivate all the time. And as I, as I learned to be patient, as I learned to watch that, I really saw my uh, results start to improve. Think about the rod location too. Uh, where are you gonna place the rod? Um, you can go to the cuspid, you can go to a bicuspid. You know, bicuspids a lot of times will give you more lower incisor control, but it might be too vertical. Uh, you can change it throughout treatment. You, know, you can start at the cuspid, go to the bi, or sometimes if we see too much vertical, I'll take it off the bi, put it back to the cuspid. So think about that. You know, look at that proper activation and how long forces is going to be in place. So I mentioned really cinch that lower arch wire. Just don't put your pliers in and turn it. We'll go behind the wire in between the wings and we'll squeeze. Uh, either cinch the upper arch, chain it, or you can even do both if you'd like. If you're really trying to maintain that arch as one unit. Uh, we looked at that bicuspid ro ro location to reduce those lower incisor proclination. And like we mentioned with the wire mount, look where you're positioning that ruler, but also make sure that your patients are biting in centric relation or centric occlusion because that's um, often a common misconception too that people feel that they have to uh, position into a class one to measure. Actually what it is is you gotta be in that centric relation or centric occlusion uh, as you measure. When the patient bites in the centric relation or centric occlusion, you should see about two millimeters behind the stop on the rod or the curve if you're at a 22. You should be able to completely compress that spring. If you're seeing the rod come out the back, that's overactive. Here's the more correct appearance of uh, activation. If it's overactive, it'll look like a rod and it'll swing out to the side. So we really want to avoid that overactivation. Here we are with our, our post forces correction. We can see the significant change we we're able to, and I think really, you know, pretty well control those lower, upper and lower incisors by using the correct, correct activation. There we are, D bonde. I'm just, just so exciting to look at the difference for him. Yeah, he's such a such a nice young man, and I just we were just talking to his grandma uh, earlier because we've got a, we've got a brother working with as well. So here we are at our, from our initial to our deep on, and I'm not sure I would have been comfortable using a forces before I understood um, the proper activation and the amount of incisor control and um, amount of correction that I could get. So just really, you know, consider your options when you're creating that effective force system. We've got so many options now, you know, occlusal tubes, we've got wire mounts, we can use them and place the rods in different brackets, cuspids, bicuspids, we can put omega loops and wires, crimps on wires, we can use them with our aesthetic brackets. I mean, there are just a lot of options that, um, that I wanted to share and kind of give you some things to think about as your treatment planning cases and what you can offer patients and really what can differentiate your practice and set it apart and just really do some exciting things for patients that will make other people notice and, and want to be your patients as well. So I you know, thank you for your attention. I hope you found some useful information and now we're going to head back up to our, our question and, and answer period. Thank you, Dr. Valitra. That was 
a really, really good presentation. I have some questions, um, but before I get into those, I'd like to invite viewers to use the question box in the control panel to ask any questions that you might have. Um, our first question that we that we got in today was, do you always set up your push rod between the fours and fives instead of between the threes and fours? No, I don't. And it really depends on how we want the four system uh, to be developed. Uh, Often we will go behind the first bicuspid. Uh, sometimes we will in our more significant class two malocclusions. We may start at the cuspid and move. We need to first look at the activation. Sometimes behind a first bicuspid, a 22 would be overactive. So check your activation and then really look at when you're placing the rod, is it going to be too vertical? And you need it more horizontal. So there really is, we use both of those locations as we're um, setting up our force system. Okay, our next question. When would you use an omega loop on the arch wire? A uh, way you can use an omega loop on the arch wire is that if you really need to establish a more vertical force system, um, by dropping that loop in, you can really create something that's uh, very vertical. Maybe you've got someone who's got an open bite and you want to rotate their maxillary occlusal plane through posterior intrusion and the maxillary incisor is coming forward. Or you may have someone that is um, so class two or, or young enough that even the smallest rod is too, um, is too active. So you can use an omega loop to increase um, the length. You can use an omega loop to um, create a more vertical force system. Or you can even use an omega loop if you don't have all of the, the teeth bracketed or if you, for some particular reason, do not want to have a push rod against a, a bicuspid or a cuspid. Oh, and to do that, make sure that, too, that you have, you know, obviously a rigid wire. You're going to have a steel wire placed. And probably the trickiest part about bending those omega loops is making sure that as you're bending it, you're not distorting the arch and changing the torque anterior to that loop. Okay, our next question. What do I need to consider when installing a forces wire mount? Uh, things that you're going to need to consider is, one, do you have the maxillary arch aligned uh, and do you have the transverse dimension that you need? Um, also, are you in a rigid wire um, that's going to be able to support that? You know, often in a ligated bracket, you're going to have a steel wire and you want it to be a full-size wire. You can't run these off of light wires. You can't run these off of night high wires because the force is going to be onto the wire itself. The other thing to consider, too, is how you're going to secure that arch wire. Are you going to cinch it distal to the molars? Are you going to um, tie it back? The, the thing that you have to remember is you know, that module is on the wire. If you were just to place and not try to secure the molar at all and just to really start to do a lot of distalization, be careful that you don't fall off the edge of your arch wire because now that wire mount is, is attached to that. So um, just really some of the main considerations is what's going on with the maxillary arch wire. Okay. Um, for more severe cases, do the sevens have to be erupted and bonded? Okay. Um, it, it really depends. With what, you know, what about second molars? And to me, the, the rule of thumb that we use in our office, if somebody has an increased lower face height, if they have an open bite tendency or an, uh, an, an, uh, a vertical growth pattern, I want to include second molars because part of my treatment objective is to intrude the posterior molars, kind of like a posterior hypo headgear effect. So if I need to control the posterior vertical, I have to have my second molars bonded if they're erupted. Now it's the opposite. If somebody is deep, has a decreased lower face height, and I don't want any posterior intrusion, I'm going to purposely stay off the second molars. That way they can act as my posterior vertical stops. So for me, second molars are included in my forces setup if they're open, increased lower face height, uh, vertical growth pattern. If they're deep, have a decreased lower face height, I stay off of them. Okay. Um, how do I choose what wires to use, and how am I going to set up the case prior to installation of the forces appliance? Um, as far as wire selection, obviously some of it depends if you're working on an 022 slot or an 018 slot, um, and it really depends what type of forces appliance you're going to be using. Now, if you think about your lower arch, you're going to need something um, 
We usually recommend either a steel or a beta wire because the rod, again, the rod rests on the wire. You can't run them off. The lower arch cannot be a thin wire, cannot be a flexible wire. So we're going to want to uh, be into that rectangular wire in the lower arch. The upper arch, we're again going to want to be uh, usually in a rectangular wire. We're going to have the transverse set, um, rotations eliminated. And if we're going to be using a wire mount, it needs to be more rigid because again, the wire mount is resting on the arch wire itself. If I'm going to be using um, I, I, I got the one that's running off of a headgear tube, if it's a, a wire, uh, an easy module or an L pin, I have some flexibility. I may choose to use uh, a rectangular wire that's a NITI wire, not a steel or, or beta wire. So it really kind of depends what kind of wire, what what system you're going to be using. Just the, the key point is if you're using a wire mount, the mount itself is on the wire and that's where the force is. Um, the lower, the rod is always on the wire. So again, that's where the force is going to be. So we need to have um, a wire that's stiff enough so that, that it can support that force and not deflect the wire. Okay. Um. What tips do you have for making installation of any type of forces plants easier? One of the biggest tips that we found is get your wire set first. We used to, I used to get so excited that we're going, oh, we're going to start getting rid of your overjet, or I'd say overbite, obviously the patients, that I'd put their wires in and put their forces in all the same appointment. And those longer appointments, patients tend to get concerned because they know they're going to be here longer. One of the, the easiest things to do is put your wires in first, get the wires set. Send your patients away for two weeks, four weeks, till you know those wires are passive, and then put your forces in. And the thing is, you can put a forces in quicker than you can teach a kid to put their own rubber bands on. And the thing is, what is probably the most uncomfortable part are the wires, not the springs. And most kids, when you put the springs in, they're like, okay, that was it. Now those wires last time, that was a bigger, that was a bigger deal. So you may want to try splitting those appointments up. Also, some other tips, and a lot of this is patient motivation. We start talking about forces from the very beginning. Um, just did some consultations today. It's like, you know, we used to make kids wear headgear. And now you don't have to wear a headgear. You get to wear springs. And we start talking about it from the very beginning. Braces will line up your teeth. Your springs will fix your bite. And then you get your braces off. So they almost start looking forward to when do I get to that part because they know that's the next step. The other thing, too, is to make sure you have a model chair side that patients can play with so they understand you know, how this works um, and also give them some goals. Okay, we like to take photographs and we're also taking films because a lot of them are used for studies to show people, oh my gosh, this is what your overbite was. I bet the next time you come back, it's going to be less and you can keep comparing that. Um, I've even gotten into some bets with people. It's like, okay, if you, if, you know, young man is like, I'm not wearing these. I'm like, well, if you come back and your overbite is not less, next time we'll take them off and I'll give you a gift card. Well, you know what was going to happen. You know, he came back and it was less. He's like, all right, I see. And I said, was it was it very hard? He goes, no, because the thing is, particularly if you install them, if you install them with the right activation, if you, um, if, particularly if you're behind a bicuspid, and you can't see it. It really pretty much auto-corrects. They just have to be, you know, you know, careful with it. Not any more careful than the arth braces. You know, when people ask, do anyone ever have a hard time getting adjusted to me? Yeah, but those are the kids that have a hard time getting used to adjusted to braces as well. So you can pretty much predict that. Uh, I think where it gets a little trickier is when people were using them kind of punitive, like, well, you didn't do this, now I'm going to make you do that, instead of it being part of the plan all along. Sorry. Um, Oh, no, that's big. my next question is related to that, um, is how do I increase patient acceptance and comfort when using the forces of plant? So that's kind of related to what you just discussed. Yeah. yeah, and that's really one of the big things. If, you know, when you overactivate the appliance and it starts to roll out to the side, that can be uncomfortable. But if you really watch your activation, you can keep them in nice and close. You know, with a wire mount, too, you've got a smaller span. So that sometimes is much more comfortable for patients. So when you've got a larger distance and you're trying to go to the cuspid, but if you can eliminate that rolling, that's where a lot of you know the patients would would say, okay, I didn't like that. You know that was uncomfortable, and you know so it's the activation. It's really where you're placing it. It's preparation of the patient um, that will make you know, compliance and make their acceptance so much easier. 
Okay, next one's a three-part question. Okay. What are the most common clinical complications? How do I avoid them? How do I correct them? Ah, perfect. Okay, probably the biggest complication, and I would know because I've seen them, is when loss of control of your lower incisors and loss of control of the upper incisors, where you start to see the upper incisors start to kind of retrocline, or you see particularly lower incisors start to um, flare, or you see spacing in the lower arch. Now those flaring the lower incisors and the spacing in the lower arch can come from a couple places. One, maybe you didn't cinch the arch wire well enough, or maybe you overactivated the appliance. Uh, the upper too, when you start to see a loss of that torque when the upper incisors start to tip back, there may be a it could be overactive or it could be too much resistance. Maybe I have the wire cinched or chained and I should unchain it. Uh, and the other that relates to that overactivation is when the molars start to roll out. So if I see lower incisors start to procline, if I start to see molars start to roll out, one of the first things I need to do is check that appliance and make sure it's not it's not overactive. And if, it's, if it is, I want to decrease that activation. Now, if you see significant lower incisor proclination, you may want to take that appliance off and just let it rebound. The one thing I, I found myself is when I take a forces out, get rid of the rigid wires, put a, a more flexible wire, like a night tie wire, it can still be rectangular, and let things start to rebound. Sometimes people get really concerned about those lower incisors, but part of it, they'll rebound some just when you take the rod out. But if you find that you're proclining too much, just take that rod out, go back and maybe chain molar to molar to recover those lower incisors, and then put the appliance back in. Now it takes a little planning on the front end too, because you have to think about from the beginning of the case, where do you want your lower incisors when you go into your forces? So you may have to upright them to be able to, to control them. So your biggest clinical complication really comes from overactivation or um, not having a transverse dimension too because it, what happens is if you're too narrow on the top you put your forces in and it's at an unusual angle and as it starts to roll out to the side it can start to roll your molars but I always tell people don't panic because if you if there's if ever you've seen anything really weird happen with your forces take it out put some night tie wires in take a deep breath <laughs> and let the patient go away and you'll be surprised six weeks later how much of that recovers because what you've done is you've removed that, the, the, the force, the contraindicated force. You may choose at that time to, to go back into your forces appliance. Other, I'm tempting, other app. Oh, one other um, complication you can see uh, clinically is that you may have a bracket become debonded when the forces is in place. I used to take everything off, put them all back together, but now I don't. If you see a bicuspid or a cuspid that's pushing, that the rod is maybe pushed off, um, what you can simply do is remove that bracket and put a crimp stop on the rod, or even just take that bracket and we'll kind of squeeze it down and make it its own stop. You can pick up broken brackets later, but once you get the forces and keep, keep going. Um, and so that was kind of another clinical complication that sometimes would, would bog us down because I take everything out, put everything back on and start that over but just keep going and you you know some of these kids the, their biggest issue is that overjet you gotta get you gotta get them to class one and then you can line up any teeth that are uh, maybe you've seen some movement that you know some rolling or maybe a lost, lost bracket throughout forces. Okay, our last question uh, that we have time for today is how long do I leave the forces appliance in place? Oh, good question. How long would I leave in it? Well, it kind of depends first how far you have to go. The average forces patient probably has an appliance in about six months. It's about active four. You know, just your, your standard class two correction, you place the rod, you get that two millimeters, you activate it, you're usually there, and then I'll keep it there in that inactive state for one appointment interval. So most of them have them completely out of their mouth in six months. Now some of the more significant full step class two or maybe severely retronathic, those kids will have those appliances in for up to even 11, 12 months. Or sometimes if you're going through an asymmetry that's maybe a mandibular skeletal asymmetry. And uh, yeah, or if you know if you're using them in a non-growing patient, and those are those, you know, those 25-year-olds, the 30-year-olds, they're gonna have them in longer too. 
um, because you're, you're not going to get that same treatment response um, that when you place a forest during peak growth you're going to see an accelerated response and it was in an article that was published using our cases in Angle probably about two years ago by um, Dr. Savello and Fallis. So if you're using it past peak growth or you're using it in adults they're going to wear it longer. So your standard adolescent about six months more significant you may be going to that 8, 10, 12 month period. Adults you're probably looking closer to about a 7 to 8 month period. Okay, I know I said that that was the last question but we did get a quick one. Um, okay. Have you considered sliding easy clips for the upper wire? Uh, pardon, can you repeat that? Have you considered sliding easy clips for the upper wire? I'm not sure. I'm trying to think what that would be. A sliding easy clip for the upper wire. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm having... Okay. I'm not sure I completely understand well, that. You can, uh, we can email that person. And okay, that'd be perfect, yep. Now, but that's our last question for today. Okay. Right, thank um, you. And uh, I wanted to thank you for, for a wonderful presentation and thank everyone for your questions. Um, but we have run out of time for today. Um, as a special gift for viewers, uh, 3M is giving out two free complete cases of the Aesthetic Class 2 correction system. Make sure to visit 3M.com slash aesthetics for your free cases or call 1-800-423-4588. That's 1-800-423-4588. This information will appear in your control panel chat box along with a handout for more information about the Forces Appliance. Following the webinar, we'll send you a recording of the presentation, and we thank you all for attending, and again, we thank Dr. Alvitro for your wonderful presentation. Well, thank you. I hope you found it useful. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Bye-bye.